Kevin Gordon here from Autosavant.com with your afternoon commute. Coming to you from the 17th of January on a reasonably miserable, rainy Philadelphia Tuesday. Uh, got a couple things for today. Wanted to talk through some of the stuff that's going on with TrueCar.com. Talk about uh, some increases in production in the Jeep Wrangler. In addition today, I wanted to talk through the redesigned Acura RDX that came out at the North American International Auto Show and close up the day by talking through uh, a lawsuit that is taking place against the Acura RL and really only because they spent so much time on the RL yesterday that when I saw this pop out of the news, I thought it was interesting enough to cover. TrueCar.com. TrueCar.com is where uh, I actually went to buy the long-term F-150 EcoBoost. They are a site where you can go in, build a model, and they give you pricing at local dealers. And in general, they give you outrageously good pricing at local dealers. A lot of the times, below invoice. And... Um, it always, you know, I always sort of wondered how long it could continue to exist, even though the dealers in some ways have to sign up to be a part of it. Uh, but recently, uh, regulators, and by regulators, I'm, you know, assuming it's a group of people who are a little bottom hurt by the fact that they've been losing money. But nevertheless, regulators have stepped in and said that what TrueCar.com is doing is unlawful and uh, the way it's unlawful is because they are you know there's there's two issues with it one is the fact that true car is getting paid based on leads that turn into sales which I had no idea was illegal and if there's any lawyers out there that'd like to explain it to me that'd be great it's true, I could probably do a simple Google search, uh, because I believe this uh, practice is also known as bird dogging, so I have to believe a simple definition's out there. But I'd like this to be an interactive video blog, even though it'll be asynchronous. Nevertheless, this practice of uh, paying somebody for a lead that turns into a sale has been deemed to be illegal in, I believe, 20 or 23 of the 50 states. The other issue that some states have with TrueCar is the fact that they uh, provide discounts based on the invoice price. And it is illegal in some places to advertise based on invoice price. As a result, uh, the CEO and president of TrueCar came out and made some public statements and that they're going to be changing their business model, so on and so forth. What they're going to be doing is turning into a subscription service in some place, uh, having uh, users register before they can get information in other places, and really fundamentally changing their models so that in the past, if you bought a car through TrueCar, TrueCar was paid $299 if it was a new car and $399 if it was a used car. Now, dealers are going to have to sign up with TrueCar to be a part of their service, which somehow gets out of any of the legal trouble. It should be interesting to see how they continue to exist in the new model. Uh, I hope they do well, although, you know, I hope that everybody in the world doesn't start to use it because I think the massive discounts that you can get through it will eventually start to go away if enough people try to start buying their cars that way. Moving on, the Jeep Wrangler sold so well in 2011 that the uh, Toledo Blade, a newspaper I'm assuming in Toledo, Ohio, is reporting that uh, Chrysler's going to have to step up their production line by adding workers and eventually uh, bumping output from, I believe, 40 to 45 units an hour coming off the line. The Wrangler and Jeep as a whole uh, 
increased in its sales 11% last year, which is you know much higher than the rest of the industry, even though the rest of the industry typically had an up year last year. And one thing that I didn't know, I thought that was interesting, is that Jeep makes up 60% of all of Chrysler sales overseas. So the demand is not just coming from the United States, it's also coming from the world. So they're going to start making more Jeeps. The thing that sort of caught my eye about this is the fact that the Jeep's as popular as it is. It is true that you know, last year it received the new Chrysler Pentastar 3.6 liter V6, which, you know, does a range of things to improve the Jeep. It's got 26% more horsepower and 10% more torque, or 26 more horsepower and 10 more torques. Uh, it gets 10% better fuel economy. It's faster, 0 to 60. It finally can claim a 0 to 60 time of under, I believe, 9 seconds, where it used to be up in the 11s. You know, all in all, it's a great improvement for them. They've also really stepped up the quality of their interiors. The problem is, is they're stepping from such a low place that still they're a reasonably rough place to spend time. It isn't the fit and finish or the material so much, it's just the fact that the box that the Jeep is and the suspension technology that it's on makes it a pretty noisy, rough place to be, even with all of the improvements. Now, of course, those are the things that make it great off-road, where it should be. The problem is, is and I apologize because I didn't get a chance to look them up, but I'm assuming, and I'll check the data, and if I'm wrong, I'll leave it in a comment on the video, but I'm assuming that a large portion of their growth in sales has to do with the longer wheelbase unlimiteds and uh, longer wheelbase four-door Jeeps, which fundamentally just get to be you know, SUVs that wind up in parking lots of movie theaters and grocery stores. They've become soccer mom cars. For soccer moms that want to come off appearing a little bit more rugged than the people who just go buy a unibody SUV. So good for Jeep, you know, it sort of goes into the whole thing that is probably going to continue to be a trend in most of the things I talk about. It's the fact that if you continue to shoot for the middle, uh, it will increase sales volume. The question becomes is will you start to alienate your user base? I don't think that Jeep's going to really alienate their user base because people are still going to go buy two-door short wheelbase Rubicons and use them for what they were intended for. Uh, but you know, if you want to sell a lot of them, target the middle, target people who want something a little softer, a little bit easier, and you know, it's a sales success. One other thing I wanted to talk through was, uh, I guess, one of the final remaining things from the North American Auto Show that uh, didn't come up in a lot of coverage, but it's the fact that Acura released the next generation of the RDX, so their smallest SUV, as a, uh, I believe, concept, but really it's very close to being a production-ready car. And the big announcement there was the fact that they are going to be going away from their uh, 2.3 liter, 2.4 liter turbocharged motor, and they're gonna move over to their uh, V6, which basically powers their entire line at this point. I owned a 2007 RDX, and uh, I bought it first model year uh, because of all the tech that it had in it, and the fact that it had that turbocharged motor, which was rated at 240 horsepower and 260 foot-pounds of torque when it was released, sounded great. Well, in practice, you know, it was a sporty thing to drive. It had the super handling all-wheel drive system. So for what it was, it was actually, uh, you know, as much fun as a small SUV can be. But the turbo motor really got some pretty deplorable gas mileage. Uh, it's become a running joke between uh, you know myself and some other people that the EcoBoost F-150 is getting comparable gas mileage to the RDX if you factor in the difference in cost of premium fuel which it was required in that car. And uh, as our editor-in-chief Chris Hawk pointed out when he called in on the phone, the thing that's 
what's sort of more amazing about that is the fact that, you know, Acura, which is Honda, has had to give up on a smaller engine and replace it with a larger engine that's getting better fuel economy. And I was kind of wondering, like, what, you know, why is that? Why can't Honda, with a turbocharged motor, get better fuel economy against their V6 when everybody else in the industry seems to be moving to smaller engines and a lot of the times smaller four cylinders with turbochargers. And I think what it is was that when Honda built that engine for the RDX, they built it without direct injection. And that seems to be the real magic thing that's going on these days is with direct injection or some of the other injection technologies uh, like we'll talk about on uh, either this or a future episode of the Afternoon Commute. Manufacturers can control so much of what's going on in the combustion chamber and run much higher compression ratios for a reasonably high-strung turbocharged motor. Without it, Honda couldn't do that, and as a result, seemed to have to... All right. So, Honda really... Uh, missed pretty big on the fact that they never either designed that engine or, you know, had the ability to switch it over to direct injection. And the final point on that is I have to wonder if internally in Acura heads are rolling as a result that they went through all the R&D, which these days is quite a bit, to produce an engine that only made it into one model and a, you know, reasonably small production run model as it is. So, you know, in the future, the RDX is going to have the same engine that really is going to be in all the other Acuras and Hondas going forward. Should be, you know, another nice entry in the small SUV segment. And, you know, we'll see how it is when we get the chance to drive one. And to close out the day, the Acura RL hit the news because of the fact that a lawsuit that was put in against Acura was fundamentally lost by the plaintiffs. So the people who sued Acura did not win. And what they were suing about was the Acura collision avoidance system that was available from 2005 or 2006 through 2008. And the fact that it didn't work as intended, it was slow to respond, and potentially that inclement weather could even, you know, make it useless altogether. Here's the thing that I thought was interesting about this. There was 2,000 plaintiffs. Now, if you watched yesterday's afternoon commute, you'll know that they only sold 1,000 RLs last year. So you have to figure about one in five RL owners must have been a plaintiff in this class action lawsuit against Acura. Now, it's probably a bit of an exaggeration. Early on in the RL's life, it sold better than a thousand units a year. But still, it's an enormous percentage of the population of owners that were named as plaintiffs in this lawsuit. Still, the lawsuit was thrown out for a bunch of legally technical terms. One of them had to do with the fact that, you know, initially they thought it would only apply in California and it wound up applying nationwide uh, or it couldn't apply nationwide. And the bigger issue seemed to be that there didn't, uh, there wasn't enough of a harmony in the plaintiff's complaints to, at least the judge decided, to make it a valid class action suit. So there you go, your afternoon commute for January 17th here from Kevin Gordon from autosavant.com. You can always follow me on Twitter at autosavantkg. I'm also part of the Autosavant Facebook page and I look forward to talking to you tomorrow.